Understanding Cross-Cultural Psychology. Can research methods and psychological interventions that are developed in one part of the world be effectively applied in other cultures? Research has been published in the US and it has focused way too narrowly on Americans. And Americans actually comprise of less than 5% of the world's population. So there was a detailed analysis that was done, and this is in your book. It was a detailed analysis of peer-reviewed publications in leading academic journals in psychology. And what it showed was that more than 90% of research samples came from a very small group of people. And this small group of people was a very small group of countries that represented only about 12% of the world's population. So what do we know? What can be developed in one part of the world and be effectively applied in other cultures? Well, we do know that sociocultural factors impact the way that people act, the way they think, the way they feel. But the same scientific study might actually yield different results in different groups. So what remains unanswered is how substantial these differences are. If these differences are negligible, then regardless of where we're born or where we're raised, human behavior and psychological experience should be able to be based on very similar universal mechanisms. However, if these differences are significant, then as scholars or researchers, we actually need to pay closer attention to differences that are going to distinguish people from dissimilar backgrounds. So basically, the overall trend here is that the current state of psychological research lacks diversity. Again, research that is published in the United States that we tend to read here focuses mostly on Americans because that is the sample that we can take from. But again, it comprises less than 5% of the world's population. So what is cross-cultural psychology? So basically, before reaching adulthood, we do not choose where we live. We don't choose what language we speak. Instead, we tend to learn how to understand things by what is around us. We understand things by the wishes of our parents, the societal requirements, and the traditions of our ancestors. So basically, we don't choose our culture. So the way people learn the way they learn to relate to the world is through their feelings, through their ideas. But what happens is it affects what these individuals do as well as their actions. And it has that bearing on their thoughts and their needs and emotions. So what cross-cultural psychology is, is it is a critical and comparative study of cultural effects on human psychology. And we will get into that a little bit more in two slides on exactly what that means. So basically, the cross-cultural psychology is going to examine that psychological diversity that happens to come up between cultures, as well as the underlying reasons for that diversity. So think of it as a comparative perspective. So basically, we're going to compare the links between cultural norms and behavior and the ways in which some particular human activities are influenced by different or dissimilar social and cultural forces. So what does cross-cultural psychology attempt? Well, it not only tries to distinguish the differences between the groups, but it also is trying to establish the psychological universals as well, or that phenomenon that is common to all people and groups. So think of it as we're not just looking at differences here, we're also looking at the similarities. So we sometimes want to look at and identify those commonalities with regard to the structure of a human personality. So 
think of if you guys have taken social psych or even when you covered social psych in elementary psychology, think of the universal traits, the universal social traits, the neuroticism, the extroversion, openness to experience, the agreeableness, the conscientiousness. Those are things that are universal among culture. It, it does not matter what culture, what background, those are going to be universal. So the big question that we get is how is cross-cultural psychology different from cultural psychology? So with cultural psychology, we're actually just looking at the study that is going to seek to discover our systematic relationships between cultural and psychological variables. Now remember with cross-cultural psychology, and I put the definition again right here, we're looking at a comparative. We're looking at similarities and differences. So cultural psychology is just advocating an idea that the behavior and the mental processes are just an interaction between that one particular culture and that one particular individual. So we'll get into that a little bit more here on this slide. And this is figure one one in your book. So you guys can see here that in this figure, the cultural psychology is going to deal with culture. And sorry about that. Going to deal with culture and it's going to deal with the individuals. And it's basically going to deal with that interaction that you have right here. Whereas cross-cultural psychology is going to be basically two different cultures how they are different and how they're similar as well as how they intersect. So you can kind of see how that difference plays out here. Let's take a look at a few basic definitions that you are going to have to know throughout the rest of the semester. And these are really important because a lot of times people will use all of these terms interchangeably but these terms are completely different. So culture. Culture is a set of attitudes, behaviors, symbols that are shared by a group of people, and it's usually communicated from one generation to the next. Race. This is where you're going to have a large group of people that are distinguished by certain similar and genetically transmitted physical characteristics. Now, Race can be part of culture. It does not necessarily have to be part of culture. Think about somebody who has been adopted. They are going to communicate, they are going to share the culture that their adoptive parents have more than they will most likely share or adopt the culture based on maybe their ethnicity or their race. So that brings us to ethnicity. This is going to be our cultural heritage. This is going to be the category of people where we share a common ancestral origin, a language, or possibly even a religion. So this is very similar to culture. It's very similar to race, but it is completely different. So an example of this, when you think about ethnicity, so when we let's talk about first with race. So let's break race down into white and black. And I do completely understand there are way more races. I'm just using these two as an example. When we get into ethnicity, your race sometimes does not matter when it comes to ethnicity. You could be black, but you might be Cuban. You might be Hispanic. You might have Irish. When you're white, same thing. You might be Danish. You might be Spanish. You could be um, Asian American. Any of, any of those things can fall under ethnicity because it's that cultural heritage. And it's going to continue to go back based on your bloodlines. Then we have our nation. With our nation, this is where we have that large group of people who constitute that legitimate independent state. 
and they're going to share a common geographic origin, a history, frequently a language. So for me, I am Irish and Polish. That is my ethnicity. I am white. That is my race. I am American. That is my nation. So all of those things play into that culture that has been passed down to me. And then finally, we have that religious affiliation. This is going to be a term that's going to indicate an individual's acceptance of knowledge, their beliefs, and their practices that are related to a particular faith. Again, a lot of times religious affiliation is going to play a part into a culture. So again, I'm going to continue to use myself as an example. One half of my family was very Irish, so they were also very Catholic. Um, my Polish side of my family, they also just happened to be Catholic as well. But that religious affiliation is was part of my culture as I grew up. So there's a great deal of confusion that comes along where people across countries, how they use these terms. So an example from your book is Christian Arabs that might be residing in Israel. They do not call themselves Israeli Christian Arabs. They are Israeli citizens. But the, the Arabs, they commonly see their Israeli identity as kind of a civic or a legal one, that nationality, not as culture. Now, on the other hand, for most of the Jewish population, Israeli citizenship serves as both a legal as well as a cultural identity. So what can be often labeled as maybe race or ethnicity in the United States could be used as a term of nationality in other countries. So that's why I said these are all completely different. They should not be used interchangeably. However, they are going to be completely different depending upon what culture we are in. Now, this is table, um, I want to say it is table one, two in your book or figure one, two. I'm not quite sure and it doesn't look like I have it on the slide and I apologize for that. But what we're looking here is we are actually looking at the 2010 current census. Now there is an updated book that just came out. So I do have the 2020 current census here and we'll go through that. When we talk about race, because that is a big one. A lot of people confuse race and culture and they use them interchangeably. When we're talking about race, we are talking about, as you can see, five main races. And these are the five kind of main races for the United States. So this is the United States Census Bureau. So white is going to include anybody from European origin Arab origin, even Central Asian origin. So when we talk about Central Asian, we're talking about India, we're talking about sometimes maybe the little islands that are down there. Black is going to include people of African origin. Native American is going to include the people of American Indian, Eskimo, and Aleut. Asian is going to include people of East Asian as well as Pacific Islander origin. So a lot of times those from Hawaii actually identify as Asian in terms of race. And then Hispanic is going to include people of South and Central American origin. Now, as we all know, the United States is a large melting pot. So most people don't necessarily belong to just one of these. They very well could belong to more than one. We usually tend to identify as one, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is just one. So to get into the U.S. Census Bureau, and I always use this because it's really important to kind of understand the makeup of the United States as we continue to go into all of the different studies that we're going to cover throughout the semester. So the total population in 2010 was 308 million. It's expected to be 439 million by 2050. As of right now, 
or as of the census in 2020, we were at 331.5 million. With white or non-Hispanic, we are looking at 223 million, about 72% of the population. It is estimated to go down that we will in 2050 be 181 million, that white will be only 43.6% of the population, so less than 50%. However, the 2020 census does have it at 253 million and about 76.3%. So it actually has gone up, not down, like it is estimating. For black, the 2010 current census you can see here is almost 40 million. Our 2050 estimates is gonna be about 59 million. You can see there's an increase here. If you take a look, you're gonna, you can see that there is only supposed to be a decrease in white non-Hispanic. That black is gonna increase, Hispanic Latinx is gonna increase, and so is Asian. Now, currently, black is at 45 million, so it is definitely, it's at 13.4%. That trend is going up like it is estimated. Hispanic was at 50 million, 16%. Currently, we are at 62 million, 18.5%. That trend is also going up. And Asian is at four, was at 14.7 million. We are now at 20 million in the United States, up from 4.8% to 5.9%. And these facts and figures are all in the notes section of the PowerPoint for you to see. So it's actually looking like um, the Asian population is expanding and growing more than was originally anticipated. So this is a case from your book. It is from your textbook. It discusses the difference between nationality and ethnicity because that comes into play a lot also where it is being used interchangeably. So when you talk about nationality and ethnicity and how they're understood in the United States, there are different ethnic groups within most nations. So again, the United States is not an exception here. So similarly, there can be different national groups that are within a particular ethnic group. So let's take a look at these examples from your book. So this is the same nationality, but different ethnic groups. Martha and Martin are both U.S. citizens, so they have the same nationality. They're both Americans. However, ethnically, Martha is Brazilian because her parents emigrated from Brazil when she was a little girl. She received her U.S. citizenship a few years ago. Martin is a seventh generation New Yorker. His ethnic roots are completely mixed. He's Irish, French, German, and Russian. So that shows how you can be the same nationality but different ethnicity. Now, let's look at the opposite. Same ethnicity, but different nationality. So, Hamed and Aziza are both Palestinian exchange students that are living in New Jersey. Hamed's parents live in Tel Aviv. So, both he and his parents are Israeli citizens, but they are, they are Israeli citizens, but, they are, but he is Palestinian. Aziza is a Jordanian national and holds a Jordanian passport. So she is Palestinian, but she's from Jordan. So that shows how you can have the same ethnic group, both are Palestinian, but different nationality. One is from Israel, one is from Jordan. This is a cross-cultural sensitivity um, example that is in your book. and. The reason I include this is that we have to remember that, especially in the United States, as human groups, we are constantly moving, constantly mixing with others. Now, some countries do prohibit a person from changing certain affiliations, such as maybe religious affiliations. But in the U.S., cultural diversity is encouraged. And usually people have the freedom to identify with, with whichever ethnic, religious, or national identity that they choose. So in this example, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'm going to give you the overview and you guys can read it yourselves. Again, this is in your book. 
So basically, they're in a emergency room. A woman is asking the young doctor where she went to school. She says she went to Wake Forest. The woman continues, what's your nationality? She says, I'm an American. The woman argues and says, no, your nationality. You look Chinese or Vietnamese to me. She says, no, I'm, I'm an American. I was born here. That's my nationality. My parents came from China, but they're U.S. nationals too. So I guess you can call me Chinese American. The lady was very loud and said, I see, I knew I was right, you are Chinese. So this, this is because some people do still associate the word American with that particular European look. However, that's not what the United States is. The United States now is a very multi-ethnic community. And people need to remember that because of the fact that we are constantly moving and mixing around with one another. This is table one, three from your textbook. And basically it's just an overview of the four types of knowledge that we are going to cover this semester in cross-cultural psychology. So scientific is the first source, or is the first type. And with these sources, think about scientific research, psychological phenomena. We also have popular or folk knowledge. This is basically things that are commonly held beliefs, things that are passed down from generation to generation. We'll have an ideological type of knowledge, so a stable set of beliefs around, about the world. Think of the nature of good and evil. These are gonna be your ideologies, kind of what makes up your personality. And then there's gonna be that legal. The legal is definitely going to be that knowledge that is kind of encapsulated in the law and it's going to be kind of detailed in those official rules. And that's going to be different in every culture because every culture has different rules. So when we think about this and we take a look at this, an example that I'm going to use, when you go to, let's uh, say the UAE, the um, Arab Emirates, Basically, women down there, they, they wear, and I cannot think of the name of the head covering that they wear, but it also covers their face. Now, as tourists, they do not expect in their culture tourists to wear that. So it's not a legal thing. However, they do expect tourists to not swear. Uh, I believe kiss in public is another one. I know PDA is a, is a big one, but swearing is a very big. It is actually against the law in their culture and in that country. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to legality. And we'll get into that a lot as well, especially when we cover the emotion chapter. One of the other things that we're going to discuss is going to be cultural traditionalism. So when we're talking about traditional cultures and we're talking about non-traditional cultures, we're kind of talking about maybe the opposite of what we think it is. So one of the things here and that'll be mentioned in your book is the majority world and the non-majority world. The majority world is actually the eastern part of the world. Think of very traditional, very religious. Think of most of Asia, um, most of Africa, most of the Middle East, whereas the non-majority world is going to be those Western countries, Western European countries, the United States, Canada, Mexico. That's what we're talking about here. So when we talk about the traditional and the non-traditional cultures here, we're basically talking about two different types of cultural roots that are identified. So our traditional culture, and over here, these are just a bunch of different um, examples of traditional culture, but basically it is a cultural construct that's based on traditions, rules, symbols, principles that have been established predominantly in the past. So this tends to be kind of confined usually within local and regional boundaries and doesn't tend to cross over. Now the non-traditional culture and examples are going to be right here for you. 
is going to be more of that modern construct. And this is going to be the new principles, new ideas, new practices. Definitely think of the United States in terms of this when you're trying to differentiate between the two types of cultural traditionalism. We will also get into an empirical examination of culture. And these are three things that are going to be mentioned quite often in the studies. And that's why I put them in here. So when we think about the studies that we're doing and the academic psychologists that have been working, they have to conceptualize their results in terms of basically cultural dichotomies. Now, what they're going to do is they have uh, taken these three dichotomies and they have categorized them in a high versus low. So with power distance, this is where the members of a society accept that the power in the institutions in, and the organizations is distributed unequally. With uncertainty avoidance, this is going to be the degree to which members of a society feel uncomfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. And then the uncertain orientation is going to refer to the common ways that are used by people to handle uncertainty in their daily situations and lives in general. And again, you can be very high on this or very low. So let's take a look at uncertainty avoidance. The degree to which members of a society feel uncomfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. So there are going to be certain nations, certain cultures that are going to be very high on this meaning they feel very uncomfortable when there is uncertainty or ambiguity. And then there's going to be nations or cultures that are very low on this, where they, they feel they're perfectly comfortable with uncertainty. They don't care if there's really certainty. That's what we're kind of talking about here. The other one that is extremely important is individualism versus collectivism. Now, this is going to be the first activity that you do is you're going to fill out and answer questions on whether you're an individualist or a collectivist. So an individualist, they are typically interpreted as very complex and they are based on concern for oneself, their immediate family, or their primary group. They are not very concerned for other groups or even the society to which they belong. Individualist countries, and we will get to this in a couple of um, slides, very much the United States, Australia, those Western non-majority countries. Collectivism is typically going to be interpreted as behavior that's going to be based on concern for others, care for traditions and values. They're going to care more about their groups and their society than they are about themselves and even their immediate family. These are going to be the not, um, I'm sorry, these are going to be the majority countries. Think China, um, countries in Africa, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Those are all going to be collectivist countries. So in an individualistic society, the needs, the preferences, the desires of the individual are going to receive more attention. Think of it as they emphasize the me over the we. And then collectivism is going to refer to the cultures where the needs of the individual are actually subordinate to that of the group. So definitely where they put the we over the me. And this is one of the most robust dimensions of culture. And it is mentioned so many times throughout the rest of the semester. You guys really need to have a good grasp on it, which is why I do the activity um, that you're going to do this week. So it describes basically how members of a culture actually determine their identity. So a couple of examples here. With an individualist, you're going to be motivated more by personal rewards and benefits. You're going to set personal goals. Your objectives are going to be based on yourself. And individualistic workers, they're going to be very comfortable working by themselves, 
with autonomy and not part of a team. Now, on the other hand, collectivists, they're going to be motivated by group goals. They're going to have long-term relationships that are going to be very important. They will easily sacrifice their benefit in order to recognize and honor the team. And they do not like being singled out or honored as an individual from the rest of the team. It's actually very embarrassing to somebody who is collective. So a couple of countries here. And I told you we get into the countries, so you really understood. So our individualism is going to be found mostly in our Anglo countries, Germanic Europe, Nordic Europe. Our collectivism is going to be found in Arab countries, Latin America, Confucian Asia, Southern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. And in about two slides, we'll have a map. You guys can really see how these countries are, like how, how the map looks. It's, it's pretty neat. So just some countries here, individualist and collectivist countries. The most individualistic we're going to find, U.S., Australia, Great Britain, Canada, Netherlands. Our least individualistic or our most collective, Guatemala, Ecuador, Panama, Venezuela, Indonesia, South Korea, and Taiwan. So you can see here, and we will get onto this. So here is the map, the collectivism, individualism world map. So if it's white, they weren't able to gather any data, unfortunately. The darker the color, the more individualistic they are. The lighter the color, the more collectivist they are. So you can see here that Canada, Greenland, Iceland, uh, the United States, very, very dark. A very large part of Western Europe, Australia, South Africa are going to be the darkest on our maps here. Then we're going to have some that are a little less dark. So we're looking here at like Russia, some of the Eastern Europe, Northern Africa, Egypt, um, some of the more Middle Eastern countries that are a little more uh, technologically advanced, India here, a few of the South American countries, again, a little more advanced, a uh, little bit more collectivist. Mexico is one that plays a part where it kind of falls in the middle, and it's very hard. It's getting pulled by down here and pulled by up here. So you will meet people um, from Mexico that are very collectivist, depending upon where they grow up or, and or very individualistic. And then same thing you can see here, China is going to be a little bit lighter, uh, some of these middle African um, some of the other Asian countries. So think about, though, the countries that are white. And they, they ugh, sorry, the countries that are white and do not have any data. Does that mean that they are one or the other or a very good mix of both? Or does that mean that we just can't get to those people in order to find out? So. It's, you know, it's one of those things. Now, are there any other countries you think would go one way or the other? Do you think there's any countries that are going to be moving from one to the other over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? So those are just some things to think about here. So still talking about individualistic and collectivist, we have to look at sociocultural orientations. And this is actually a figure in your book that I kind of reorganized. It's figure one, two in your book. So what came up was Harry Triandis. He offered kind of a more detailed, sophisticated understanding of the phenomenon that we know of as individualistic and collectivism. So he basically suggested that we examine vertical and horizontal dimensions, that it's not just a one-size-fits-all. So what he did here was he looked at, he took social relatedness, and then he broke it down. Are they independent? So are they individualistic? 
or are they interdependent, meaning they're collectivist? And then he kind of broke it down a little more. So there are those that are independent, but they might have unequal social status or they might have equal social status. Well, then they're going to fall under a different type of individualism. individualism. And same thing with the interdependent. We're going to have an unequal social status and an equal social status that is going to fall under a different type of collectivism. So what he basically thought here was totalitarian regimes, they're going to emphasize equality. So on the horizontal level, but not necessarily freedom. Where Western democracies, they're going to tend to emphasize freedom. On, they're going to be on that vertical level, but not necessarily equality. So if we go on a little bit more, and this is also in your book, this is table 1-5, you can see that these national examples are going to vary. So for instance, you can see that collectivism in the United States is going to be different from collectivism in Asia. Individualism in the United States is going to be different than individualism in Australia. So you just have to take a look. So when you look at vertical, our social structure is going to be a hierarchy. The horizontal is always going to have equality. When we do control intent, individualism is going to have some kind of change in environment where collectivism is going to adapt to their environment. Individualism is going to be progressive. Collectivism is going to be traditional. Vertical is going to be rigid in the gender status. Horizontal is going to be a little more fluid, so on and so forth. So you can see that there is going to definitely be a difference between the types of individualism and the types of collectivism that we're going to see country to country. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're individualistic, you're going to be individualistic compared to everybody else that's individualistic. Now let's get into our last few thoughts here. Uh, just a few slides left. And just so you guys know, this is one of the longer lectures. So money and happiness. When we're talking about money and happiness, in terms of individualistic and collectivist countries, wealthier countries do tend to be more individualistic. And now that you've heard that, go back to the map and take a look. And what happens is this probably is because there is kind of less need to basically be reliant on other people. Also, in individualistic countries, life satisfaction depends a lot upon a person's personal feelings as well as their experiences. So that's, you know, that plays a big part in it. Our personal feelings, our experiences is what leads to our satisfaction. In a collectivist culture, that broader social context, those cultural norms are going to influence life satisfaction much more than those personal feelings and those personal experiences. So some final thoughts on individualism and collectivism. There's no one size fits all. Korean collectivism is, is completely different from Japanese collectivism. French individualism is completely different from American individualism. You can even go so far as to say an American individualist person is completely different from another American individualist person. So no one size fits all here. And finally, let's get into our cultural syndromes, our approaches, and our additional key terms that we just need to know for the rest of the semester. So our cultural syndromes, everything we have defined so far, everything we've gone over, describes either one or several characteristics of a culture. So what is the concept of a cultural syndrome? So it's basically any type of pattern, any type of combination where we have shared attitudes, a shared belief, categorizations, definitions, norms, values, 
anything that can be organized around a particular theme. And it can be among people who speak a particular language that uh, live during a specific historic period or even live in a definable geographic region. So some examples from your book are tightness. So an example of tightness are basically particular rules and norms that are going to apply to social situations or sanctions. So your book kind of talks about religious groups having common foods that are possibly unique to strangers, possibly food rituals, dietary restrictions, sacred feasts. Those are all part of tightness. Our cultural complexity. This is going to be the number of different cultural elements that we have. Everybody's going to be different. Everybody's culture is different. Activity and passivity. Basically, this is our action versus our thought. Honor. This is going to be our attitudes and our practice that support our aggressive actions in the name of kind of a self-protection. Communalism is very similar to collectivism, especially in African contexts. Now, there's familialism, which is family orientation in many Hispanic contexts. And there's a combination of both that goes along with kind of conformity of family recognition and humility. And that can happen in Asian contexts. And finally, our embeddedness. Our embeddedness is where we emphasize the focus on the welfare of our in-group, so basically the groups we belong to. And we tend to limit our concern for those that we see as outsiders. So again, more of an individualistic cultural syndrome. When we talk about cross-cultural psychology, there's going to be many approaches that you guys are going to notice when you are looking at different types of studies, different research. We're going to have a national sciences approach. This is what we really think of when we think of research. Description, prediction, understanding of natural phenomena. Think of biological or life science. Cross-cultural psychology relies a lot on the field of genetics because we do have to look at heredity through genetic transmission. We also have social sciences approach. This is a big psychological approach that we use to research. So concerned with society, the relationships among the vid individuals that kind of live inside of it. We have our humanities approach. This is going to be the subjective side of the individual. Think of more of the self-understanding of somebody. Our eco-cultural approach. This is how people interact with the environment, transforming the environment to it, to themselves, as well as themselves to the environment. A cultural mixtures approach. This is the big one we're going to talk about in cross-cultural psychology because we're looking at that interaction of cultures. We're looking at those differences and similarities. We're looking at the interconnected systems, the multiple cultural identity. And this is because, again, because cultures are constantly, people are moving and mixing, there are a lot of bi, tri, multicultural individuals. And you're going to have roots in at least two or more cultural or ethnic groups. So that's where this cultural mixtures approach comes. And then finally, the integrative approach. Basically, the integrative approach is looking at that we are not determined by any type of cultural influence at all, that we're actually free, active, and we exercise our own will regardless of what has been passed down to us. So these are all approaches you will see in the different types of studies that we may visit throughout the semester. And then finally, some additional key terms that you just need to know. You will hear indigenous groups. These are going to be those groups that are protected by international or national laws. They're going to retain specific rights based on their historical ties to a particular territory as well as their cultural and historical uniqueness. Um, we tend to think of these as Native Americans, American Indian. 
There are other cultures as well. There are other indigenous groups. Ethnocentrism. This is in exaggeration. So it's the view that is going to support judgment about other ethnic, national, cultural groups and events that form an observer's own outlook. So we will talk about that a little bit. And then finally, multiculturalism. And that's one that we cannot forget because especially when we get to our generation, well, my generation, your generation, which, which is the generation right below me, we are all bicultural, multicultural. And so this is going to encourage that recognition of equality for several ethnic or religious groups in one country and is going to promote the idea that we have the right to follow our own values and practices. Now, I know this was a long, very long chapter, and I do apologize for that, but there was a lot of important things that you needed to know in order to continue on. So now that you have all of the key terms, activity one is the first activity that you're gonna do. This is gonna be your individualistic versus collectivistic assignment. And basically all it is, is you're going to be filling out a form, answering questions to figure out whether you personally are an individualist or a collectivist. If you have any questions, as always, please reach out to me, text, email, we can set up Zoom, and have a wonderful week.